Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Virginia, the Virginia SBDC's webinar series, Google and Beyond, Marketing and Managing on the Web. This series is designed to take a look at tools and techniques to help small businesses take, a, take their business to the next level. Today's webinar is Understanding Big Data for Small Business. All of our Google and Beyond webinars are presented by Ray Sidney Smith, Ray, web and mobile strategist, author of Solo Mo Success, Social Media, Local and Web Small Business Marketing Strategy Explained, and president of W3 Consulting. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those questions into the question window and Ray will do his best to answer them. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC Network for having me here on the Beyond Google Marketing and Managing on the Web series. Today, as Tracy said, we'll be discussing understanding big data for small business. And just a couple of housekeeping notes as, as usual. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask those questions here now on the live webinar. If you are listening to this on the recording, feel free to go ahead and send those questions at W3Consulting on Twitter, hashtag them beyond Google, and I'll be happy to answer those questions, or someone here on staff will be happy to answer those questions as well. At the same time, feel free to go ahead and uh, follow the handle at Virginia SBDC, and that will allow you to be able to learn about upcoming and future trainings as well as these live webinars that we host here on the Beyond Google series. So with that out of the way, let's get into the topic of discussion for today. So a funny statistic that I just came across, to, well, at least a startling statistic that I recently came across, was the volume of business data worldwide doubles every 1.2 years. So just about every year, the amount of business data across all companies is doubling. And really that's the topic of our discussion today in terms of your data in your small business. So we'll be covering, of course, what big data is. And then, of course, we'll be talking about the opportunity that big data provides to small businesses like yours. And then I'll talk a little bit about how to get started collecting that data and using it to some extent, how you can apply that in some of your business areas. I won't talk about, talk about that too much, but I, I do want to talk about the collecting side more than the using side right now, just so that you can get understanding of what big data is and where it's going to go in the future. So let's get started with defining big data. So what is big data? Well, big data, according to at least Google, is this idea that you have large amounts of information and you're collecting it in various what we call data silos, that is places in your business that you start to collect data. And we'll go through a little bit of an exercise shortly uh, about that. And what we can do with this data is start to understand patterns and trending opportunities as well as connections between those pieces of data so that we can start to better understand the behavior, in our case, of our customers. Now you may want to learn more than just about your customers, but we're going to keep it at that point because you may want to track some data analytics about your staff and about your referral partners and other kinds of things. But in this regard, we're just going to talk about big data in the sense of taking that, that large data set or the large data sets that you're collecting and starting to analyze and synthesize them so that you can start to understand your audience better. So that's big data in a nutshell. And what we can talk about when it comes to big data is really where the sources come from. The first thing that the first location that they come from really is internal information. So we collect information over time in our businesses and if you're not a startup at least you've been collecting data since the beginning of, of your business, potentially before your business started as you were collecting marketing research and other kinds of data for you to be able to understand what your target market looked like and what your comp competition looked like and all of those kinds of things. So the internal information that you've collected over, over time is a part of now your quote unquote big data. So you have all of this information and traditionally big data really s stops there. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways we think of big data only as, as that portion of, of, the, of the set. But over time, it's pretty much uh, been morphed. So I'll, I'll stay here for a moment just so you can understand 
what we're talking about because big data came from an enterprise perspective. So internal information collected over time became this gross, grossly large amount of information that IT had to sort of manage. And they traditionally characterized it as having volume, variety, and velocity. That means the speed of the generation of data. So volume, of course, is having a lot of it. Variety is, of course, meaning that they fit into disparate areas. So in a large enterprise, you'd have data in disparate locations. You might have data in human resources. You might have data in customer service. You might have data in legal. You might have data in you know, marketing. And so all of this information was being held in these various data silos, but not really connected to one another because they really didn't interact on that level. They wanted to interact in their own, own means. Well, today we don't really think about it that way when it comes to small business because so much of your operations are overlapping. Well, so should that data. Okay, and so that's the whole idea behind it is taking that and really de dealing with it. Uh, just so you have a, a better understanding, today we, we take not just the three V's, volume, variety, and velocity, but we also talk about var variability, uh, which is the uh, problem of uh, who analyzes uh, the data uh, and uh, dealing with you know the the uh, inconsistencies of data over time that is and of course complexity the data complexity is the is the other sort of fifth component of big data as it's been traditionally or sort of modern day defined uh, but moving along so we have internal information that we collect over time. These can be from a single source now in small business where you have just a pile of invoices, you know, or a, an invoicing software that you've been collecting over time. So you have this data about your customers. They may be names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, as well as what you've invoiced them for and when they've paid, other kinds of data points. Okay, so each of those things are sort of like a field or a column or a row that you would collect data in in say an Excel spreadsheet and we'll talk about that pretty much from a, a database perspective sort of a table and database perspective as we move our way along so think about these as things that you can put into a spreadsheet which is almost everything okay so from a single from a single source think about that one area of your business where you're just collecting information of course, you could take them from multiple sources. So you have internal information that you're collecting from multiple sources that may be your invoices plus your accounting software. So your invoices may then be data entered into your accounting software either through an automated means or through a manual means. So you're just taking that data and flowing it into your accounting software. Now your accounting software is doing additional information processing for accounting purposes, maybe tax purposes, maybe business decision purposes. Well, either way, that data is multiple sources using that data together, and it's the beginning of really big data, right? Because you're allowed to, you're capable of making now more decisions in a better, more informed perspective. Okay, so we talk about internal information that's collected uh, from single and multiple sources. Then there are, of course, external sources of information and a lot of businesses, especially on the small and medium size, don't really have access to large data sets. So they want to be able to, uh, that is large data sets about their outside world, that is people beyond just their customers. So we want to be able to access some of that information. Uh, so for the marketers out there who are listening, please, this is not buying lists or buying email addresses. Do not do that. Uh, <laughs> I know a lot of people immediately go to that sort of perspective. No, this is like taking external sources like weather data. If you, uh, if you look up census data and allow that into your database, well, you can get a lot of information related to your audience by being able to look at publicly available data sources that that might be you know geographical uh, based uh, you know statistics that are covered like I said meteorological data uh, you know so weather patterns those kinds of things other kinds of out outside sources of data about things that are related to your business you know so if you're a real estate agency you might want to look at driving patterns that are collected by the local engineering firms for your region, state, or what have you. And by being able to look at those driving patterns, you can see changes in residencies uh, and, and residency patterns by how long or how far people are driving. 
taking that data and relating them to your own database of purchasers and sellers and those kinds of things can then give you a better understanding of your market and therefore a better understanding of how to position your properties on online and offline marketing uh, venues. So you have lots of different opportunities to be able to connect external sources of information, large data sets outside of your business information and and relate those back to your internal information and create that connectivity that really becomes very powerful. So external sources of information can go from everything from uh, information you can collect and glean about your competitors, at information that you can collect from government and other kinds of uh, nonprofit as well as private information sources that are credible to you and that you can of course then source into a database format. So really if it can be turned into a spreadsheet, it's something that you should uh, you should be able to use in terms of of a data set, and therefore you should be able you if you think that information is useful to you, then you should bring that into a database format that you can then use with the rest of your big data. Okay, so that's the idea. Think about various areas in which you have internal information and external external sources, and then blend those together to be able to get a better picture of your of your business world. So. Now I'm going to take everyone through a little bit of a, an exercise, a challenge. What I'd like everyone to do right now, just in the minute, and I'll be talking while you do this, so just go ahead and, and, and start uh, pulling up a piece of paper or opening up a, a document on your desktop. But what I want you to do is I want, to make, want you to make a list of all of the data that you collect about your past customers, your current clients, and potential customers, ones that you might uh, collect through marketing mechanisms like email subscriber lists or other kinds of things throughout your business year. So go ahead and start making that list. Just quickly jot down what data you do collect about your customers in every area of your business. What information is it that you pull from various areas? So here goes a couple of prompts. Think about tools you use to interact with your customers. So those tools may be paper-based, they may be electronic or otherwise, but think about the various tools that you use because the, the, at each point of the tools that you use to interact with customers are areas where you are collecting data. And that data may be in different pools, you know, they're, they're sort of walled gardens, they're, they're disconnected from one another, but they fit inside the same business and therefore should be communicating with one another. So think about the tools you use to interact with customers. Where are, what are those tools and what information is being collected from them? That's definitely one area you want to, want to sort of capture now. Next up, think about the various departments in your small business. If you have departments or different areas of your business that you're managing, even if you're a solopreneur or, or a, small, a micro business, think about yourself in terms of the various hats that you wear. You know, when you're in sales mode, when you're in customer service mode, when you are dealing with uh, deliverables and handling the core parts of your business. With those different hats on or those different departments in your business, where are you collecting data? What particular data points are you collecting and why do you collect them? There's probably a good reason you started collecting that data. Well, it should be thought about further how they connect with one another. How does the accounting data connect to your legal and regulatory data that you might collect about a customer? So if you're going back to that real estate agent, uh, real estate agency or brokerage uh, example, if you are collecting data about your potential buyers. Well, you're collecting quite a bit of, of financial and legal and other kinds of uh, information. Well, how does that really relate to the properties that you're listing and, and other kinds of things? How, how are those pieces connected to one another? And finally, think about the offline paper and the digital web sources. Many times, getting the offline and paper data sets into digital so that you can look at them is not as difficult as you think. So if you can take your offline or paper data and digitize it in some way, shape, or form, then really start to think about where you're capturing that paper data, not necessarily that you even change your business processes to not capture on paper. For instance, many retail and restaurants still use paper 
uh, you know, paper tracking of various types of receipts and other kinds of things. In the real estate construction world, you'll have paper-based invoices and those kinds of things done on-site, on the job. You're not changing those things, but you're capturing data on them, and it might be very easy to capture more data into your digital world so that you're capable of using that in a big data perspective. You may even decide that you're not going to use the data from the past, but starting forward, you're going to start collecting that data into your system. So what offline paper and digital web sources are you collecting now or potentially could collect in the future? So with that, you'll start to develop now a list of data points that you want to start collecting uh, together in your mind so that you can start thinking about the, the, the associations. Remember that big data is about the not only just the patterns and trends, but also the associations that are created from the collection of this data. What could you learn from what are seemingly disparate areas of your business when those data points are connected together? What can you learn from the, the inventory that you have on the shelves comparative to the information you learn about your customers when they exit your website? Okay? There's, a, there's a good bit of information that can, be, that can be culled when you take these disparate kinds of information. Okay. So I hope everyone got something out of that challenge. I hope you made a good list and that you have some uh, good ideas about uh, what you could do with big data as you sort of move your way along. And that brings us really to the big data opportunity. What can small business do with big data is really important. And so I want to really cover uh, the, the aspects of the big data opportunity that are most prevalent to most of the small businesses that I see taking advantage of it. So what can you do when you're armed with big data? First and foremost, you can streamline processes. One thing that I've noticed quite frequently in many of the businesses that I consult is that many of the processes they have were built in a startup mode. So in the startup scenario, there's a business owner and perhaps a couple of other people or there are founding partners and everyone's sort of scrambling. You're hustling to get all of the things done in a particular day, the days are never long enough, and you just keep working until one day the business sort of grows, and when the business grows, you continue to keep growing. So you hire more staff, and you implement new resources and tools, and the business just sort of grows organically. Well, the problem with organic growth many times is not necessarily that it's bad, but it's certainly inefficient. You do things out of, out of virtue of necessity and not necessarily out of the, the sort of uh, forest level view. You know, you're sort, sort of still cutting down trees and not looking at it as, in terms of forest management. So by being able to look at all of this data together, you can actually start to see where you might have inefficiencies in the system and be able to close up those open holes and therefore have a much smoother, streamlined, uh, workflow, not only internally, but also for your customers. Think about the ways in which your customers might have bottlenecks in the purchase process or in deliverable process. So if they are, you know, if you're, if you're trying to uh, close up the fulfillment side, well, you can do that by looking at the data. The data will tell you where the problems are most frequently. If you're collecting the data, you can probably see what and how the problem is occurring. So this, of course, time and time again, as I've seen, lowers operating costs. Lowering costs equals higher profitability, so that's always a great thing. And so streamlining processes is really one area where small business can gain huge benefits, huge dividends for being able to do those things. So think about areas of your business with the data points that I just challenged you to make a list of. Where in those areas might you be able to save money? because you, you're able to connect the, the, the data points. Is there parts in your accounting, accounting software that can show you where there might be leaks in other areas of the business? Yes. So look at them. Check them out. See where they might be able to connect to other data sources. You know, is your inventory system connected to your point of sale? Is your point of sale connected to your accounting software? Is your accounting software connected to your social media and other marketing tools? Think about how those might be streamlined together to be able to create a more seamless and uniform workflow. Next up, 
is of course marketing. Marketing is a huge part of small business. I've heard statistics that show that 80% of, of small businesses' time is spent in a marketing mode. And so, of course, you can use big data to market better. One, as, it's, as the definition of big data talks about, it's about learning how your customers behave. And the more you learn how your customers behave, the more you can take that as an opportunity to market to them better. So as you understand your, your target market better, you're capable of relating to them better, you're capable of catching them where they are when they have a felt need or want, and therefore you can increase your revenues. You can go ahead and put the right products in front of them, the right services uh, you know, uh, before them when they have the, the need or want to be able to use those services or buy those products. So targeting your market better is definitely a great opportunity for small business. So looking at your advertising, you know, ad spend, looking at your marketing generally, looking at your referral sources and being able to see how a brand advocate within your business is sharing that content and sharing your name across various social and web properties. Um, tracking email so that the email can be connected into your customer relationship management software so that you know that that's, that information is being handled appropriately and being able to communicate better with those people can really increase revenues in dramatic ways if you just pay attention. And finally, gaining edges on your competition. Now, I tend to think of competition differently than most small business sort of experts, if you want to call them that. But I really think of competition as being a community of people who help serve the same population. You work together more than you work against one another, but it's sort of like the adage says, you know, know your friends but know your enemies better. The reality is, is that you should know your competition very well. And big data can really allow you to do that. So much data is available online today because of social media and other kinds of online interaction that being able to go online and uh, collect this data about your competition is really important. You really need to be able to collect that data and of course that means you have a competitive edge over being able to differentiate over time and that means what makes you different? Why should I go to you versus go to your competitor? Well, using big data, you can really do that. You can really separate yourself from the competition by, by showing yourself differently to your customers and improving your products, improving your services and the quality of services that you're providing. So gaining an edge on your competition is definitely another one of the big data opportunities. Think about the various other opportunities that will avail you by being able to access big data and you know, start to put down your own reasons. There are your own motivations for being able to access and incorporate big data. So think about big data from the perspective of increasing revenues, reducing costs, and of course getting to know your competition better. There are many other opportunities. Getting to know your own business better, getting to know your customers, getting to know your employees and vendors and other shareholders in the business better is also a possibility within big, big data. So there are many opportunities. These are the top three that I think are most important for small business and I think that there are many more that you can come up with yourself. So let's move right along so to, to, to making better decisions with big data and that means getting started with big data. Okay, so getting started with big data really just means the process of collecting and understanding how to use that data. So the first thing that we want to do is to understand that collecting big data is actually rather easy today. The complexity really comes into connecting the data and then of course using the data properly. So there are lots of tools out there for being able to collect the data and we already have them in many parts of our business. So we should really start with collecting the low-hanging fruit. That is, we have lots of stuff going on in social media and in our web, web strategy and in our mobile stuff that's being put out there. So get yourself a branded short URL. Make sure that you're out there putting that, that 
data through uh, a short URL. If you don't know what a short URL is, I just posted a blog post about this uh, today, and it's about short URLs, why you should create and, and uh, deal with a branded short URL. You can just go over to our website and do that, and uh, the website will be on the last slide, so you can check that out. But you should definitely get a branded short URL, and use that for all of your social media sharing activities. By doing so, you're collecting all of the data of who's out there, who is you know, sharing this, this information about your business, and you can start to listen, you know, the listening activity in social media that is going out there and searching for conversations that are happening about you and responding to them, being responsive to the conversation that's happening about your business. So get a branded short URL and use it for all your social media sharing activities. There are really amazing tools out there that allow you to be able to uh, collect this kind of data. One that I really like is called TAGS and T-A-G-S. It's currently in version 5 and you can just Google it. Just type in T-A-G-S Twitter and what it does is it takes either your handle, your business name, or a particular hashtag and you can go ahead and track all of the conversations happening about that. It automatically does it within Google Sheets, so it does it inside Google Drive. And just automatically, as I like to say, it collects all of this data and now you have a, a plethora of information about the tweets that are happening in a particular industry vertical, happening in your in and about your business or what have you and you can start to see these conversations see the patterns that are happening see the people who are talking about you your business your industry in your particular locality you can do very sophisticated searches using a free tool that collects and manages that kind of social media sharing and there are tools like that across almost every new social network site that is worth its muster so go out there get a branded short URL and use it for all your social media sharing activities and that's just a one start, one avenue into collecting that big data. Okay, next up is to track all of your email correspondence. Uh, that means not just marketing but also non-marketing email correspondence. Frequently small businesses communicate you know, quite often with their customers by email but that email is not actually connected to any central database. So you might not know what's going on in a non-marketing perspective as it relates to your customer because it's not connected to any central repository of what's happening. So if you're sending out marketing newsletters, well you may not notice that your marketing newsletter went out this morning and then you emailed your customer right thereafter about something either non-marketing related, you know, maybe customer service or a, a piece about fulfillment right after that. Well, what happens to both of those emails when that customer receives that? those both correspondences, both, both pieces of correspondence right next to one another. Well, that's really good information for you to know, but if you have them tracked separately, then how are you, how are you to know that? You really need the two pieces of marketing and non-marketing email correspondence connected to one another. You might even notice that when you share something on social media at a particular time, then share something by email marketing software like MailChimp or Constant Contact or, or iContact, you know, and then, of course, email them via some non-marketing correspondence. Well, they have different interactions with each, with each of those, those pieces of data. Well, how, what's happening? Is there something good happening or is there something not so good happening? And how can you change that to be more advantageous to your business? Well, you need to start tracking that data. You need to start capturing it. And there, are, there are really great tools out there that you can use to be able to track email uh, just recently, I, I saw an, an email uh, tool uh, called Sidekick. If you go to GetSidekick.com, HubSpot, the marketing automation software folks, they uh, have just developed this free tool, and you implement it in your email software, and it shows who's opened your email, when they've opened it, whether they've replied, and all sorts of other business information analytics as you as you interact with that particular email point. Uh, so. You can get that information, you can then port that into your uh, email marketing software potentially. I don't know the, the depths of the software itself, but there are lots of different kinds of software like that. And 
So taking your email marketing software, pulling that out of the out of the software, taking your tracking email out of your regular email correspondence and blending them together, you're going to get a better view of what's going on with your email correspondence with your customers. You can do that with, of course, telephone, uh, you know, calls and all sorts of other data. Your uh, telephone bill, for instance, usually comes with a list of all the calls you've made. And so you can probably get that data into a spreadsheet somehow. So think about all of these disparate locations where you may not traditionally think about collecting data, but the data's there. So the next step with low hanging fruit is collecting the information in sort of the accounting and finance realm of your business. So you have account statements. I just talked about your telephone bill, but you know every bill that you receive, that data is collected in there, and they create more granular you know information about you from on their side, but on your side, you're collecting that information about your customers and, uh, and, and, and clients. So your accounting software, your bookkeeping software, your point of sale every time you run a transaction, how is that information being collected and what kinds of information can you collect more of to be able to have a, a more fuller view of what's happening with your customer. So uh, I had a client who was using their point of sale system in their retail location and realized through just adding a couple of fields, asking them where they where they learned about the retail location because this was not a was not a on the main drag in, in in the downtown location. It was sort of off the beaten path. So you really had to work to find this retail shop. Well, they just started asking that information and using a little bit of data analysis and synthesis, they were capable of understanding that they were getting a large amount of traffic from referral of another business that happened to be on the main main drag. So they were able to then give marketing materials and other kinds of marketing support to the business that was referring them business and they increased their revenue by about 15 to 20 percent. So they were able to use their big data in a way that really made huge dividends and didn't cost them very much money. I think it cost them probably a couple hundred dollars to uh, print some new brochures and so on and so forth. Well well worth the money to increase revenue by 15 to 20 percent uh, year over year. So that's a that's a really huge amount of money to be uh, to be increasing your revenue just by looking at one aspect of your system and asking just a few more questions. You know, they were just asking the very basic, how did you find out about us? So think about where you can ask those kinds of basic questions that gets you more demographics information and that gives you gives you more business information to make better business decisions. Next up is if you already have a CRM, you can start to think about information you're collecting and then create some minimum collection standards. Uh, that means if you have a sales team out there or if you're the sales team with, with some other partners or with some other staff members, what is that minimum amount of information that you have to put into the customer relationship management software in order to be able to have an appropriate view of your customer across the spectrum? So if you don't know what a CRM is or a customer relationship management system is, uh, go ahead and check out our previous webinar here in the Beyond Google uh, series. It's there on the Virginia SPDC website. You can see the archive of the uh, customer relationship management uh, webinar and so with collecting sort of a minimum collection, having a minimum collection standard, you are able to go ahead and start to create key understandings about your customers. And just not to beat a dead horse, but the reality is, is that that's going to be really important for you to understand your customer better so that you can then start to make those, those better decisions about what's happening with the business. But if you already have a customer relationship management tool, that's fantastic. Take that opportunity to start creating those minimal collection standards so that everyone in the business knows, no matter what, you're going to get these three core pieces of information about X, Y, and Z. Okay? So that's always really helpful. Next up is your website and blog. They collect a huge amount of data if you allow them to. So really, think about making sure that you're, if, you're, if your business uh, you know, uses a, a, uh, has a website, that's great. If it has a blog, even better. And both of them should be collecting data using either Google Analytics 
or another kind of web traffic collection tool. So the, if you're using Google Analytics, it's free, and right now they have updated the system, and you have to update your tracking code in order to be able to do this, but it does an, an amazing job of looking at demographics and other kinds of information about your web visitors so that it gives you better information about what's happening with the people when they come to your website. You know, because page views really don't make a difference anymore. I could have a thousand page views and no sales. What really matters is being able to pay attention to what's happening with the people once they're on my site and what's happening to, the, to their interaction and engagement with my material. So Google Analytics is really powerful. And then of course Google Webmaster Tools. Google Webmaster Tools is Google's sort of coach for how to make your website more visible to the search engine. Google wants to help you help them get to you know, relevant search engine results pages. So have Google help you by, by going ahead and enabling Google Webmaster Tools for your business website and your blog, and then pay attention to the recommendations it makes. You know, if it tells you there isn't a sitemap, make sure you get a sitemap put together. If it tells you that it's not able to uh, you know, access particular things because of, of some JavaScript error, don't go, oh, I don't know what JavaScript is. Go ahead and find yourself a web developer. It'll cost you very little money to be able to fix those kinds of problems, but they can reap huge dividends because your customer or the potential uh, customer that comes to your website isn't getting frustrated and leaving and going and buying your product, a product or service from your competitor. Okay, so make sure that you have these things enabled on your on your websites and your blogs, so that you're capable of starting to collect all of this really rich information and understanding it better. Okay, so now that you have some data, you need to look at that siloed data. Okay, and frequently people uh, try to just immediately push all that data together. I really think you should look at the built-in reports and insight tool insights tools of the silo data first. So go look at your accounting software. You know, if you use QuickBooks or another, another type of tool, go ahead and look at that software's reporting tools first because that's really, really powerful stuff. If you, if you, if you, you know, invested in, in getting good software, then the software should be able to tell you some really important information. When you look at that information, you can then see, okay, well, this is what it's telling us about the customers in this slim view, in this narrow field of vision. Well, then you can, of course, look to see whether or not that tool is giving you a good enough picture. Maybe it is, and maybe it isn't. But you have to look at the built-in tool to see whether or not it's telling you the whole picture. If it's not, then that's when you can start to add in new data. Okay? So think about that from, from, a, from a don't, don't jump the gun on starting to mash up data when you don't really need to. Okay, so think about what the built-in reporting and insights tools do. Look at the Facebook, you know, reporting dashboard. Facebook Insights shows you quite a bit of good information. So think about what it's telling you before you go ahead and try and pull that data out and push it into uh, a mixed use perspective. Okay. Next up, Excel and Google Sheets are your best friends when it comes to big data. And so really, go ahead and download all of this data into Excel or Google Sheets. They can host and hold huge amounts of data. So an Excel file is called a workbook. Each of the sheets within a workbook are called a worksheet. Uh, so that's why it's a spreadsheet software, right? And so each sheet is a spreadsheet. Inside the sheets have, you know, are basically tables. A spreadsheet is a table, and it holds uh, each of those squares is called a cell, which has a row and a column, right? So making sure that you are understanding how an Excel spreadsheet or workbook is set up, and as well as a Google Sheets uh, you know, workbook is set up, now it gives you a better understanding of how to organize that data. You want to make sure that all of your columns are the same uh, across the, 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 the system. So if you have you know, all of your columns together, then you have the ability to go ahead and you know, organize that data a little bit faster and more cleanly out the gate. It just saves a lot of time to make sure that you know that your, your spreadsheets are set up. So when you export that data, make sure that you have the same names for, for the same fields set up. Go across your systems and see what they're doing. 
and you know it might require a little bit of uh, change here and there, but you know for the most part you can see oh okay all of our uh, clients' first names are tracked in our accounting software and in our email marketing software and so on and so forth the same way. Well, great. When we pull that data into Excel onto different spreadsheets, we now know those are the same columns or the same rows, so therefore we can match them up much more quickly and easily so that we don't get, we don't get flummoxed once the data gets uh, merged together. Okay? So really think about how you download them into Excel or Google Sheets, but those are really good places to start pulling in data and then learning about pivot tables. If you don't know what a pivot table is, go ahead and Google Excel pivot table and Google Sheets pivot table and there are great instructions and tutorials and how-to videos about how to use pivot tables. In both software, they are very, very easy to set up today. They used to be pretty difficult once upon a time, uh, but now they can collect a lot of data and go ahead and visualize that data in graphs and charts. That can be very, very important for your business. So once you do have that data, go ahead and combine that data and then understand what a primary key is. Okay, so primary keys and secondary keys. To get a little technical, in database software, relational database software, we have things called keys. The primary key is the primary sort of field or identifier that tells us what that particular database is referring to, okay? So we want to be able to take this unique identifier, uh, say the field is first name, okay? Well, we want to be able to, or product ID, let's go with product ID in an inventory perspective. Well, the primary key will then be your field called product ID, okay? And we want to be able to sort based on the product ID. So if we take the product ID and we start to sort things, everything in our database is going to be sorted around the product ID. That's because it's our primary key. So we can connect different tables to one another, that's different sheets in your Excel spreadsheet, uh, Excel workbook, by connecting it by using that as our pivot point. Okay? So our product ID across each of our sheets is going to tell us what that is. You can use that as a customer, customer ID, a customer last name maybe, or customer, uh, you know, some kind of unique customer code. But the point is, is you want to be able to use this, this one unique identifier to be, able to, to be able to look at all of the data together as one unified source. If you don't have that primary key, if you don't have that primary source, then you have to do a lot more work at connecting which one relates to which person. Okay? So primary keys, uh, again, think about this from almost anything that uniquely identifies. This could be a city location can be your primary key, and using that as the unique identifier for being able to uh, you know, pivot all of your data around that particular thing. So what's happening in Alexandria, which is different than what's happening in Roanoke, which is different than what's happening in Winchester, which is different than happening in Danville, great. That's going to be your primary key is going to be city. All right? So as long as you understand what primary key you're working with at any given time, you should be pretty good. All right? So I don't want to belabor the topic. That's enough, enough geekery for now, but primary keys are really important for you to understand in terms of combining that data and then getting the data out of it. Okay, so you're going to combine that data into Google or Excel and start to use those pivot tables. All right, really, really powerful stuff there. Next up is there are sophisticated tools out there and what we call data scientists. So data scientists are out there helping you understand the data once you get to sort of that more sophisticated level where you want to understand this stuff. There are different tools out there. I'm just going to go over a handful of them that, are, that exist right now. I'm sure that over time we're going to get more and more data science and analytics tools for big data out there as the market grows, as data grows. So just pay attention to these four and then I'll probably show you one other one uh, at the end which I think is really cool as well. Okay, so let's start with Kaggle. Kaggle is a really cool tool because what it does is it creates competitions for you to you know, design, and what it says is, okay, so we have a data problem. I have all of this disparate data, and I don't know if my customers are finding me through you know, uh, a funnel of website to email to walk in my, walking in my front door, or they are uh, introducing, I'm, I'm being introduced to a lot of customers in social media, they're making it to my website, but then they're dropping out, and they're not really converting into customers. Well, 
these folks, you could just basically host a competition. You set a prize, a reward to the person for uh, you know, coming up with a solution to the problem, and uh, then the person who wins gets, your gets the bounty. So you have uh, this whole large community of data scientists who you know, compete to be able to come up with the best big data solution for your individual small business problem. Okay? And the, the stakes can be as high or as low as you want them to be. Of course, the higher the amount of, uh, you know, of money that you uh, provide for the competition, the more likely someone's going to go ahead and want to solve it. So you know, if you don't have a large budget, uh, then you know, you're not going to get high priority in and from the data scientists, but that doesn't mean you can't use a reasonable bounty and get a really great uh, you know, reward for putting out a competition on Kaggle. So check it out, figure out what, what kinds of data problems you have once you get to that point. You know, you really, this, is, this seminar, this webinar is really about getting started with big data, so this is once you've sort of advanced into a, a little bit higher state of, of having all this data really well understood and controlled, and now you want to be able to handle and solve specific data problems. But Kaggle is a really, really cool tool to be able to do that. Next up is if you really want to get in on a sort of a, a self-service level, Office 365, Microsoft's Office 365, has an internal product called Power BI for Office 365, and it does its own uh, data analytics services within the Office 365 uh, cloud model. So this can be really cool because it can it can visualize the data for you and has interactive dashboards. It even does 3D visualization. So really cool tool for being able to do things like that. And you can, of course, share this data uh, easily. So you might want to check out Office 365, uh, the Power BI tool that's within Office 365 to see whether or not that's something that would be helpful to you. I see a hand raised. Tracy, is there a question? or? If the person wants to ask their question, I'll be happy to answer that for you. Uh, next up is a, a, a startup called Clear Data, uh, Clear Story Data, and Clear Story is another one of those uh, visualization and analysis tools. So if you are, have gotten to that point where you have a lot of big data and you want to be able to go ahead and, and see what you can do about analyzing this, these disparate pieces of data, Clear Story Data is one of those tools that's out there to be able to do that. Uh, they are, like I said, a new company, but they're capable of looking across various different areas. So if you want to look at it from a C-level perspective, IT perspective, if you want to look at it from a marketing or social media perspective, they have these tools to be able to look at those in, in various verticals. Ray, the question um, from before was, Office 365 locks you into Microsoft products and they do not provide support for migration. Is this still true? Not as it relates to Office 365's, uh, the, the, the data that you're importing into, into the Power BI is data that actually already comes from and out of uh, other systems. So in essence, that data can't be locked into Power BI because you're, you're sourcing it from someplace outside of it. Now from the perspective that you're, you're getting data locked into 365, now once you start to, do, once you start to enter data in there, then, then yes, it is, it is locked in there. I, I know of a couple of different export tools that can do that, uh, but nothing, nothing as sophisticated as being able to get everything out in one clean uh, you know, felt one fell swoop, sort of, so to speak. So, to speak. so, um, so there is a concern still about that. But if you are in a Microsoft world, if you've, you know, if you've been there and you go to 365 and you have, and you're comfortable with it, then, then maybe Power BI will help you. If you're concerned about obviously getting your data out, then you don't want to go there. Uh, if you, if you are just sourcing it from other places. You know, if you're pulling it from other places and that data is staying where where it is, then you don't have much of a much of a risk. You know, that's just a that's just a reality. Okay. Um, so a follow up to that. Um, uh, never mind. You you got answered. Thanks. <laughs> good. Good. All right. So uh, so that's 365's off. Um, you know, Power BI. That's clear story data. Uh, Domo is another one of those uh, tools that's out there. Domo is a, is, is a, a longer standing partner in the, in the, uh, you know, the, the big data world and uh, Domo does very similar things to uh, clear story, but they're, they're 
clearly out there. Uh, they're the lowest, you know, if you if you go up to sort of SAS and IBM and and Microsoft and and so on and so forth, those are the ones doing very big enterprise level stuff. It seems like ClearStory and Domo are stepping down into the medium size and small business realms, and so. These folks are doing a little bit lower, uh, you know, lower sized data sets, and that means they are being, they'll be more willing to work with uh, small and medium sized businesses. So again, you might want to check out ClearStory and Domo if you if you feel like you're in that in that layer where you're you're at a at a peak where you need to grow, and you want to be able to have uh, data scientists uh, come in and help provide you with a solution. So. Those are folks for, for, the, for the folks who really are at that level and need to grow. Uh, they're out there for you. And uh, finally, when it comes to really understanding this stuff, I still think that for most small businesses, CRMs that are extensible are the ones that are going to really grow with you. So if you don't have a customer relationship management tool, you need to go out there and, and really install one and make sure that it's, it's extensible. That means that the, the tool itself allows you to be able to extend its functionality. S extending its functionality, for me, doesn't necessarily always include interoperability, meaning that it doesn't have to integrate with your, your accounting software or those kinds of things, but it should be able to import that data and analyze that data when, it, when you need to. So you don't need you don't need your CRM tool constantly talking to your, you know, your, uh, your practice management software or your document storage solution. It, it doesn't need to do all of that. Uh, but it should be able to import the, the, the data pieces that you need it to import to be able to understand things when you need to look at that. So maybe on a quarterly basis you import the data and then run the reports and your CRM tool seems like the most appropriate place at least from a marketing perspective, since that's the primary you know, vehicle from which small businesses really make a lot of their decisions, that's really where you want your data to, to flow into. I really like Sugar CRM, which is a, an open source uh, customer relationship management tool, very similar to Salesforce.com and other kinds of tools though, so you can go out there and, and, and check out the various extensibility of this, those tools to be able to import or integrate with them and be able to see what is going on in your tools. Okay. Uh, next up is Hadoop. Now Hadoop is if you are getting to be fairly large, if you deal with a lot of data, I mean you have to have a large catalog or inventory, but some bit small businesses actually do. Uh, if you start to collect a lot of a lot of data and you really need something to manage a, a huge amount of data, I'm talking about terabytes to petabytes worth of data, then you might want to look at something like Hadoop. Okay, I'm not going to explain it here because it's far beyond what we need to, but if you need to, check out Hadoop. It'll probably solve some of your, your challenges with regard to very, very large data sets. Uh, finally, as you start to grow, you start to want to look at additional tools that have various terms here. So I tried to avoid them until now, but like Power BI, the Office 365 tool, the the BI stands for business intelligence, and as you're looking at tools and Googling on, on the internet uh, or elsewhere, you might want to look for these types of terms, B business intelligence or BI, uh, big data insight, big data analytics, data visualization. They're all terms that come up when uh, that, that different providers as well as industry experts use when they're really just talking about big data. So you'll, you'll see it used across the spectrum. They, they sometimes mean uh, tangentially different things. They may mean different things to different people, but for the most part, it's all under the umbrella of big data. So, so look for those terms as you're looking for different tools and you'll come up with different solutions for them. And then you'll see what kinds of markets uh, the, that particular tool is servicing and then finding out what the cost is and whether it will serve your needs and how they'll implement it and all of the support mechanisms and whether or not they have the data science to be able, uh, data scientists or the expertise to be able to help you with those things. Uh, just in the last minute, I wanted to jump over to a tool that's really cool and uh, I've just recently come across it and I think that it's uh, pretty fantastic, but it's called connectmyapps.com and what this does is it's a software integration platform. So as you can see on the screen, this is just their website, but what it does is it takes 
all of the various types of data that you collect in your company. It's accounting and invoicing, your customer relationship management software, email, e-commerce, and all kinds of other tasks, uh, other systems, and they start to synchronize across the system. So, for instance, if your customer changes their email address in MailChimp, it will go ahead and change that back to your accounting software. So if you use various types of web tools like I do in my business, then you are capable of going ahead and having this seamless synchronization of these kinds of data points. It seems a reasonable price and it handles a lot of different searches, uh, different services, and so you're capable of really making some amazing workflows. You can say, uh, you know, if a client adds a, you know, an item to Dropbox, then send them an email message letting them know uh, that you've received it. Those kinds of things can be really cool as well once you've set up this kind of synchronization in your system. So really think about how this is, this is, this can be used, utilized in your business. There are other services out there like Zapier and Ift, which is I-F-T-T-T dot -T com and Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com, but Ift and Zapier and ConnectMyApps dot com, there are new tools like this that are coming out that are integrating the various types of tools that we're using because so many of them are now online that it gives us this ability to be able to then uh, synchronize the data and make it so much less, you know, work on our part um, for having to go ahead and uh, data enter backflow, that kind of thing, and create workflow processes that are automated for us so that I don't have to do X or Y in my email marketing software whenever someone does something. So you can extend the, the, the services of your, of your email marketing to perhaps customer service and other kinds of, of touch points with your customer by, by utilizing this automation software. So that's big data understanding big data for small business. If you have any questions, I'm going to hand the microphone over to, to Tracy and I'd be happy to answer any of those questions and then we'll close out. Okay. We've got a couple. Um, one, also there are other systems such as free CRM that has paid options for some neat features. How does this compare? So I haven't really checked out too much of the, of the paid options for a lot of the, the community editions of open source software like free CRM and sugar CRM, they will depend upon the developers and, and the support community around them. What I know about sugar CRM is that they have a strong community support and a, a strong commercial support license structure. So that's really the only one I'm, I'm as familiar about to be able to recommend. But if there's some particular feature within free, free CRM that makes you want to use them, then of course you'll, you'll want to check them out. But I would check them out against all of the options. So like batchbook.com, which is out there, and uh, I think Matchbook is one of them as well, and, and other kinds of, of, of CRM tools that, that help you connect more pieces of the puzzle than just the traditional CRM perspectives. But salesforce.com is strong and, and that kind of thing. But I really like Sugar CRM, and I like the way in which it operates uh, for small business, and the fact that there are so many developers out there that really work to make the whole tool cohesive for you. So if you need something done, then you know that you can go ahead and get that actually done. Uh, if you have if you have a specific question about free CRM, I'm happy to answer those questions, uh, but I I don't I don't know much about the the uh, commercial support side, so I apologize. Okay. The other question, I think it's the same person that asked about the Microsoft 365 question, so I think this is back to it, but it says, sorry for the delay, There's, there still is a limitation on drop-down menu options with other KPIs. Is this still true as well? Limited drill-down interaction with other KPIs and pages. Cannot access page actions, cannot access dashboard actions, actions, limited navigation. Hoping that makes that, sense to you. <laughs> yeah, so that that's really that's really based on your on the on the service that you have. So there are different different versions. That I, my, my understanding is that that within 365 there are ver different versions, and different versions give you different access to things. I I don't necessarily know if that's within Power BI. If if it is, then I then I haven't actually seen it. I've I've seen what I've seen has been fairly 
useful uh, information, perhaps it's just not for you. So I would, I would probably move beyond Office 365 and look for a better tool that will help you analyze the data. Clearly you have, you have, a, have, have had trouble with it and there's no reason, there's so many different tools out there, there's no reason why you need to, to sort of uh, be limited by a piece of software. So go out there and find a tool that's going to work for you and that will be able to import the data that you need. Uh, you know, again, it really depends upon your needs and, and the particular, you know, uh, I mean, in this particular case, if you're dealing with KPIs, then you, you really need to, you, you have a better understanding of it than most people, and, and so you want to go ahead and, and look for a software that actually handles your industry specifically and is able to go ahead and, and uh, data crunch those pieces of the puzzle better. I mean, don't, don't use something that's generic like that when, when there are custom tailored tools most likely for your industry. Okay, well Ray, there are no more questions. Thank you all for participating today. Today's webinar was recorded and will be posted on the Virginia SBDC website under live webinars and recordings. Tomorrow you'll receive a follow-up email. There'll be an evaluation link. Please help us to continue to improve our training by taking time to complete the evaluation. <coughs> If you want to complete the evaluation now, I did post that in the chat window. See you on October 16th for advertising on Google AdWords. Thank you.